Welcome everybody to the very first in a very special series of online events hosted by Jamie's Farm called Digging Deep because we will be digging deep into better understanding children, particularly vulnerable children, how they are being affected by this pandemic, the seeds of hope that we're seeing and how we can help them grow. Now, I'm James Westhead. As, as a former trustee of Jamie's Farm, I'm really pleased to be here today. I think maybe I was invited to host because as uh, I used to be the BBC's education correspondent, I'm sort of used to talking into the unblinking eye of the camera, um, although I think we're all getting quite used to that now. Um, so why today's event? Well, Jamie's Farm, with its four uh, rural sites and, and one city site, is used to welcoming people and, and sharing all that they do, but without physical events and physical visits to enable us to do that during this strange and difficult time, online events are the obvious way to share Jamie's Farm's approach with a wider range of people. It's a chance for us all to look outwards, to hear what Jamie's Farm are doing, but also contribute to the wider conversation around young people and their well-being. And I'm excited to see that um, even as I'm talking, the number of people uh, taking part in this event is heading for 200 and more. Uh, and I think more than 400 people have actually signed up. So uh, you're part of a, of a really a significant conversation. So what to expect? Well, first of all, we're going to hear a little bit from uh, Jamie's Farm and see a little bit from Jamie's Farm with uh, the help of our very own celebrity interviewer, Jonathan Dimbleby. Um, we'll be hearing from the founders, Jamie and Tish, who's written a book on helping vulnerable teenagers. And then we're going to go wide and we're going to hear the latest research data about young people and their well-being from the leading researcher. Uh, and then we're going to dive into the issues with uh, expert practitioners who are working every day with young people during this pandemic. Now, before finally we hear from young people themselves uh, that who will be sharing their experiences with the person who has just been appointed to shape the very future of children's social care. Now, this event is going to be highly interactive, I hope. So um, I'm going to just quickly talk you through the technology that you've got in front of you. Um, let me see if I can see that. Yeah, on your right, you'll, you should hopefully be able to open up some of the, the tabs in front of you. You'll see the list uh, of all the other people who are attending, uh, but you'll more importantly be able to ask questions. There's a question tab. Please do um, ask questions. Uh, colleagues from Jamie's Farm will answer as many as we're able to and um, we, I will endeavour to put those questions uh, to our speakers. Um, now we'll also be publishing instant polls uh, to questions as they come up and so you'll be able to have your say also and uh, in a democratic uh, sense answer some of the questions and there'll also be useful links in the chat section uh, next to that. So um, that's the technology. Next, let's go first of all to the farm and hear from Jamie himself. Absolutely delighted to welcome you all today to our first ever online event. We are overwhelmed with the support we've had and the number of people who signed up and the amazing people we've got involved today. Jamie's Farm has been going for around 12 years, founded by my mother and I. Um, we've now worked with over 8,000 children across our farms. Uh, we have four rural farms here in Wiltshire, Herefordshire, Monmouthshire and Lewis in East Sussex, uh, alongside an urban farm in Waterloo. Um, We've been really excited to see the sustained progress that the young people um, we've worked with have had. We work with kids from schools, from alternative provision, but we also work with social services um, and do some family work. We see six weeks on and six months on sustained improvements in the well-being of those children, the self-esteem of those children, and crucially, the engagement with school and other institutions. Um, so we, we continue to get excited about that impact. Um, we've tried our best through the pandemic to keep, keep our farms open, to keep people here. We've managed to run a number of day visits, some residentials, um, and we've felt that we're more important than ever for those young people. 
we feel that the, what we're seeing through the pandemic is just the tip of the iceberg and we want to be able to support more young people in the coming years and we plan to do that through expansion but we also plan to do that through our indirect support and collaboration and work with other organisations like those um, on the event today. We would love to work alongside as many of you as possible to help tackle this problem and try and create a far brighter future for young people in this country. Great. Sorry, hopefully uh, everybody managed to hear um, Jamie speaking, speaking there from Jamie's farm. Now, obviously, the idea of Jamie's farm grew out of Jamie's experience as a teacher, but also that of his mother, Tisha's experience as a psychotherapist working with uh, vulnerable children for more than 30 years. Now, she's just published a brilliant book, I recommend it, called Creating Change for Vulnerable Teens. And we'll be discussing the questions that arise out of it with our panel shortly. But first of all, Tish has been talking about her book and about the ideas behind Jamie's Farm with the renowned broadcaster and our resident celebrity, Jonathan Dimbleby. I'm sitting in a barn. Um, I knew it when it was um, a shambles. It was a proper old farm barn, machinery, bits of food, bits of hay. It's now transformed and it's transformed because it's a product of an extraordinary idea, a germ which flourished. And uh, it's the brainchild of two people, Jamie Fielden, of course, and Tish Fielden, who's a very remarkable woman. She spent her entire life professionally as a psychotherapist. What she doesn't know is not worth knowing. And uh, particularly, she speaks in a language that anyone can understand. She, she eschews uh, the technical language that so many people use and therefore no one listens. And uh, it's all been produced in this book, which is called Creating Change for Vulnerable Teens. And we're going to be talking about that. It's a great great book, I can tell you. There's no jargon in it. But I want to start with where we are, this farm. I, I was lucky because I was in at the very beginning with you, because I knew you both, both Jamie and you, and you both came from slightly different perspectives. Jamie, passionate about the land, passionate about farms, you with all the qualities that I've just uh, described. What made you say, oh, let's try this? Let's create a farm called Jamie's Farm, which can serve an important purpose. Well, Jamie had been teaching, and I had started as a teacher just post-university, working with very troubled young people. And in Jamie's classroom through Teach First, he was meeting youngsters who just weren't engaging. There was a huge amount of... Um, there was actual violence in the school. And he knew that he could easily have been one of those young people if he had grown up in an inner city and not had the farming, which was for him the thing that sort of tethered him to some sanity and gave him a sense of feeling that he was actually doing something worthwhile and it had results. He's very results driven. And I felt that the young people I'd been working with were so often incredibly talented and, and very, very intelligent, but their potential was just going down the drain. And that teachers had a task that was almost impossible because they were trying to sort of rein in all this energy and frustration and often pain of young people without any language to deal with it, without a situation that could mitigate it. So it was to try something preventative, Jonathan. It was to say, well, let's give this a go, see if we brought them to a different environment. Will it work? Well, it's, it's quite an experiment, isn't it? I said it was a seed. Yes. <laughs> it's a seed. You don't know whether the seed is going to actually grow. They could no. say, yeah, I don't like the country. I don't like the smell of animals. They're dirty and That's dangerous. That's what they said. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they said. And you could be saying, to, you know, to blue in the face it's not like that come on you can discover things about yourself yeah. so it was a real experiment to start with how yeah. how did you begin to see that it was going to work give me a picture of, of i don't know one two students or something who who clearly uh, had big problems who were very vulnerable one way or another and what happened when they came here well you can imagine they came would get out of the minibus dressed as sort of often if they were boys, London cool guys, you know, white trainers and uh, their jeans hanging off their bottoms and, and look around and immediately say it stinks. <laughs> Hated the smell of a farmyard. 
But children are naturally very curious. And so by bringing them first as it was into our home and sitting around our kitchen table with them, 12 children, two or three of their teachers, and then seeing that actually well, maybe we'll give this a go. And they had each other, so the peer group is essential to them building up a sense of this being worthwhile because they're looking to impress each other much more than us as adults. But what evolved in that week was by getting them out doing real jobs and giving them the opportunity to feel that they'd chopped that pile of wood or they'd moved those sheep or they'd um, been on that fantastic walk because children respond to beauty in a way that really it lit up something in most of even the most kind of hardened the youngsters who wore their armor their response to beauty was just astonishing and then you brought to that two things from my observation yeah. one is a, a creating an, a quasi family atmosphere with responsibilities trust and also psychotherapy. And I remember hearing from you, and I imagine it is unchanged, people who come here in a very, very uh, distant, hostile way and quite often kind of break down before they pick up again, yeah. I'm putting you, they, it crudely. The behaviours can be really, really challenging um, because trust is at the core of everything. If you failed, as a lot of these children feel they have, they feel they've failed to be a good enough son or daughter, they failed to be good enough at school, they failed with the peer group, they're not cool enough, clever enough, smart enough. Um, they have this script that they failed and therefore they've got nothing to lose. And so those children will kick off. And it's constantly working with them to not reinforce that, to, to say, yeah, I can see this is really tough. Uh, you know, this is, not, this is not a sort of holiday on a beach. Um, but I think... I just think you can do this. And sitting round a table three times a day after meals, sharing experiences, building up that trust where you encourage them to see that the positivity the staff are reflecting, which as us was a Jamie and I and a few friends to start with, was something they could do for each other. And I do think the culture of kindness that can come out of what we were trying to model, if you like, was a healthy family where people have responsibilities, but they have affection for each other. And, and without that, you, you take in a situation during the pandemic, it, it continues and in many yeah. ways is worse, more, more vulnerable children. The gang culture is very powerful, people yeah. frightened, people aggressive, young people killing one another. Um, how do you... Uh, uh, rescue is perhaps the wrong word, but in a way it is, it is a rescue of people from what might have been to what could be. And, what, and what, cause how do you... How, you're only, they're only here a, quite a short time, a yeah. week or so, quite five intensive days. week. Yeah, five days. And how can you, do, how can you bring well, about that I switch? Think, I think the thing that people have always said this to me, and I've always felt that Young people are malleable, and literally the neuroscientists are telling us their brains are evolving all the time. And they are, if we attend to the parts of them that where their brain is most active, which is in terms of building identity, social relationships, helping them discover ways of self-soothing, coming out of that kind of flight-fight-freeze that they might go into... Um, if we give them that sense of meaningful relationships where they begin to build a sense of, I could be that adult, because after all, the stage of development of teenagers is, is very scary because they are a child knowing they're going to be an adult and they often don't feel ready for it. So they may become very omnipotent and show their fear in terms of fight, like a dog shows their fear through their teeth. But actually underneath it, they're very, very unsettled and they don't know if they're up to the task of living their own life, earning their own keep, managing a family themselves. And so what, what we have to do is enable those children to believe that in themselves through mirroring, if you like. And the mirroring is the feedback loop, the constant, not praise for nothing, praise for actual kindness, praise for actual deeds, praise for making a difference, you know, thanks, I couldn't have moved that wheelbarrow on my own. Or, you know, if I'm walking and talking with them, having, I don't call it therapy, but it's having a conversation, a therapeutic conversation, 
Um, those children, we've got we've got a bit of space in there. I'm not standing in a classroom cornering them, having to shout at them or give them some sanction for a behaviour. I'm inviting them to tell me what it is that upsets them. So by working to, with them in a in a way where we're working with the whole child, we've got the mind, the body and the spirit. We hear that again and again, but what it means at Janie's Farm is we're giving them role models between, of peers, adults, and an ambition and sense of self that they could be valued for different things. Now, that is really clear, but there are at least two groups that have to be persuaded, aside yes. from you, Jamie, and the people who come here. The schools yes. <laughs> who send children here and have to partially contribute the funds for yes. that, and big time, outside funders. I mean, this started, as I said at the beginning, as a one small seed. It's blossomed into four farms now, and in London, another centre, which is a city farm. First of all, the funders. How did you say to sceptical funders with resources who may like you, may like Jamie, but think, hmm, do I want to put hundreds yeah. of thousands of pounds the way of this uncertain venture? How do you persuade funders? How did you persuade funders this works? By telling them what you've told me? No, by the evidence, which was astonishing. So the evidence surprised us. So right from day one, we would, um, we tried, we produced a sort of well-being um, survey, which was a one that was a national one, so we could match it against other sorts of interventions. And we could see that these children, so it wasn't just anecdotal, the teacher said, there, I don't recognise this child. I really like this person. They'd go back to school and renegotiate their relationships with other teachers, would discover the likeable side of them. But it wasn't just that the teachers or a head would say, I, they, I never see them in my office anymore. Something's changed. They were always here because they're in trouble. It was the fact that we would follow them up before, immediately at the end of a visit, six weeks later, six months later. And what we've shown is that children begin to engage a lot better in learning. They turn up for school. They want to learn. They build better relationships so their behaviour has changed. There are far less exclusions. And it's the exclusions that's really one. Of, attendance and exclusion are real top-line things for schools. So they will save money in the long run if their children change. They'll save the attrition of teachers who are knocked to pieces by trying to deal with children who don't want to be in school. And they'll save the, the loss of income that they get if they exclude a child. And the funders seeing this had to compare it with other interventions and say, this is money well spent. We're trying to rebuild a concept of who this young person can be, and the evidence is, speaks for itself. And you've distilled all of that <laughs> in this book, your own experience and expertise, and what has happened here. But of course, an awful lot of people can't, for one reason or another, all come to Jamie's farm. No. This is a huge problem that's not going yeah. away. If um, I've read the book, so I, I believe in it. Um, yes. But uh, if uh, someone's reading, who's this for? Who's it for? And is it kind of like a self-help guide or what? Well, I, I've had the privilege of listening to thousands of children. We've had sort of 8,000 children come through the Jamie's Farms. And um, I've personally worked with or listened to the stories of so many of them. Uh, that's helped me understand what's going on behind the masks, the defences, the screens that they put up. And so I wanted to be an advocate for those children. I want to put it into some human terms that we can all relate to because we're in it too. You know, we're vulnerable as adults, they're vulnerable. So I wanted to write a book from the heart, really, and full of the stories that would represent their lives, their transformation, and what was going on behind the sorts of behaviours that give other people um, a sense that they're not worth working with. I said, because you asked me to write the forward, and I was really glad to do it. I said, wisdom shines through every page, as indeed uh, it does. And for me, and I don't know whether this is its intention, it's for any parent, any teacher, yeah. anyone who's working in the field of children, young adults who want to learn. One last thought, we're doing this, the reason why we're sitting at this great distance from one another is because of the, of the, of the pandemic. Um, 
the pandemic at some point is going to uh, allow us to return to something like what we might call the new normal. Yeah. Have you in the process of enduring that and keeping the, this enterprise going and getting it started up, uh, up again, have you, have you discovered for yourself the ways in which children uh, uh, intensely need the kind of support that you're talking yeah. about? I think children feel um, very flat at the moment. When I've spoken to some of our ambassadors and other children who've been to the farm, because we're doing some online support with them, I feel like they've zoned out and they've lost a sense of their own purpose, of future, of dreams, of ambition. They're often in families that are very fraught or parents are kind of signed off and left them to technology to get on because the parents themselves are struggling. And I think more than ever, children need to get back together in social groups like on the farms or schools creating more social learning teamwork they need more physical engagement so that they are feeling more vitality they need to get away from their screens and they and they need the chance to feel that they're re-engaging in a, in a positive society or a positive future for themselves. And what they've done is they've hibernated some and others are very angry and that's when we're hearing they're coming out feeling they've got even less to lose and that's what we have to convert them to feeling is they can be winners, not losers. Wisdom science shines through every page <laughs> and through every word, Tish. Thank you. What a fantastic film. What a fantastic interview. Um, I, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Fascinating insights from Tish and great questions from Jonathan. And the, the couple of things that just stuck with me there, that Tish has listened to 8,000 children's stories. Um, that, that's an extraordinary thing. And that's distilled into, the, into a book. And that she's trying to glimpse behind the masks. The other of fear and the other um, phrases that stuck with me are the creating a culture of kindness. Um, yeah, it's um, so much that we can take from this and hopefully learn to address these issues that were also raised and the questions which are also raised about that idea of children perhaps hibernating as a result of this um, uh, pandemic. So now before we discuss some of those questions raised by Tish and Jonathan, I'd like to ensure that our debate is really grounded in fact. So I'm delighted to uh, be able to invite Owen Carter from Impact Ed up to the stage, as it's called. Um, he's carried out the largest pupil facing study of how young people have been affected by the pandemic, built on the experiences of over 62,000 young people. Uh, Owen, welcome to our um, very uh, cosy uh, little discussion here with uh, a mere 227 people now listening in, no pressure. It would be um, great to, if you could just sort of take us through your key findings uh, from, from your research. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Owen Carter. I'm co-founder and managing director of Impact Ed. Uh, we're a non-profit organisation uh, that works with schools and education organisations to help them um, evaluate the impact of the work that they do to support young people and then hopefully um, make the most of that evidence to, to positively support young people and be working with Jamie's Farm for a number of years. Um, so I kind of have been given the, the sort of fairly unenviable task of in a couple of minutes aiming to uh, summarise the state of play for the, for the most vulnerable children in, in England around the impact of the pandemic. Um, uh, and I'll do my best to, to, concise, to be concise and, and summarise that. Um, I think really important to stress that actually even kind of pre-pandemic, um, there are significant and deep rooted challenges within our education system about supporting the most vulnerable students. Um, the Fair Education Alliance and Education Policy Institute, for example, um, found that for persistently disadvantaged pupils, by the end of school, they were tended to be 22 months behind their more advantaged peers. 22 months, it's absolutely staggering. Um, and the best guesses on the impact of the pandemic are that it's likely to widen that gap. Um, the Education Endowment Foundation, for example, thinks that the impact of the pandemic on the attainment gap is likely to widen it by between 11% to 75% based on what study you look at. Um, so there is a really, really significant challenge um, to address there. Um, our own research throws some really interesting lights on, on these kind of findings. Um, so Impact Ed's Lockdown Lessons Project tracked more than 60,000 young people across a seven month period in 2010 to 2020. Um, surveying them on factors relating both to their academic learning but also their well-being. We work very closely with schools as part of that. 
Um, and a really key thing for us was actually around um, the inequity of, of some of those barriers. Um, for example, we found that less than half of disadvantaged pupils said that they understood their schoolwork while learning remotely. Um, there are real challenges in terms of the support mechanisms around particularly disadvantaged young pupils in, in terms of um, you know, making that, that kind of home learning environment work effectively. Um, it's not just about academics as well. Um, we also surveyed children on factors relating to their resilience and to their well-being as well. And we found that disadvantaged pupils tended to perform at least 5% more poorly than their more affluent peers as well. So there's a really significant challenge uh, to address there. Um, this, this event, though, is also about um, planning ahead to the positives and, and building some towards some of those um, positive uh, kind of messages for the future as well. And so another key thing that, that come, has come really strongly about research is actually about the variation in individual needs. And we found, for example, that in secondary schools, the, the proportion of young people saying they were excited about returning to the physical classroom varied between 16% to 81%, dependent on the school that you uh, were attending. So context really matters and, and the context of who you're working with really matters. We actually found an enormously large number of um, particularly disadvantaged pupils um, stressing that this period had been a chance to reconnect with their families, build closer relationships and bonds with those around them, as well as actually in some cases, you know, learning from that kind of experience of crisis to help bond together as well. Um, so I think a couple of key messages that, that I kind of wanted to stress in terms of, you know, setting the scene for, for today. Um, one is that as the sector quite rightly thinks about um, how we can support young people and recover and catch up, that, that we're not narrow about that actually, and that that includes well-being and social and emotional development, um, as well as academics. Um, and second, that we avoid assuming that those challenges are all the same for every young person and that all disadvantaged students have been affected equally. Um, we found, for example, that um, you know, the, the nature of the support that a school puts in place really does have a significant impact on, on um, how young people are supported. Um, so we need to be really uh, careful and nuanced, I suppose, um, about, about how we um, approach recovery and how we approach catch up. So those would be a couple of key messages from, from our side um, and worth saying as well, um, that if you're interested in, in finding out a little bit more about that, um, then uh, the report is kind of widely available on as well. And you please do take a look and have a look at some of those findings, um, as well as a range of supporting resources uh, that we're making freely available to, to schools as well. Um, so well worth taking a look at. Thanks so much, Owen. And we'll, we'll be putting a link up in the uh, in the system, in the chat and on the screen, and to your research. And I, I just wondered um, before we let you go, um, what was the thing that perhaps surprised you the most out of your research? Because I, I'm listening to you, I'm a, quite surprised actually by some of the positives. But what, what surprised you the most? Yeah, I, I, th I think it is some of those positives. I think we found that, for example, um, that on the whole, particularly during the first period of remote teaching, um, pupil well-being was, was actually more stable than you might have expected. Uh, there wasn't a catastrophic decline on average by, by any account. Um, and, and that also, um, you know, there were particular subgroups of pupils that had, had actually benefited quite significantly. We found, for example, that um, some groups of special students with special educational needs found that, you know, some, some of the stresses perhaps that they might experience from going into school were, were removed. Um, so I think it is actually about those little pockets where you go, actually, oh, there has been some actually relatively interesting things to come out of this period that might be useful for informing where we go next in the system. Great. Well, Owen, thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. And, and that's exactly where we're going next to, to, to try and find out what the system, how the system should respond and what the, what, um, the experts on the ground are experiencing. But thank you. And I'll, I'll do stay um, in, in, in the webinar, but um, I'm going to invite up next for leading practitioners, possibly amongst the most innovative in their fields. Uh, they're working every day. Uh, with young people and they can help answer the question of what possible good can come out of this pandemic for the most vulnerable children in our society. So I'm hoping that, I'm, that I'll be able to invite up uh, Rebecca Boomer-Clark, who's the Director of Secondary Schools at the ARC Academy chain and also I've just seen join Rebecca Bex Kramer who is the founder and executive head teacher at uh, the Reach Academy which is a, a highly innovative uh, West London school and also director of whatever it takes. I'm also uh, lucky to be joined there we go Rebecca Boomer Clark director of secondary schools at the Arc Academy chain and I'm of course joined by Jake who, Jake Curtis who is 
Deputy CEO of Jamie's Farm, and I'm hoping, um, can't you see on my screen, is Kieran Gill with us, uh, who is founder and chief executive of The Difference. Um, as if by magic, she is. Um, so Kieran uh, has founded The Difference, which provides training to help schools working with the most vulnerable children at risk of exclusion. So we're very lucky to be joined by people. I can't imagine a group of people who could better answer um, the, these key questions. And I'll, I'll ask you each to take a couple of minutes, no more, to introduce your perspective on, on these issues. And then we'll open up to questions and we'll, we'll try and give everybody a chance to um, get their questions in. But if you could just start us off with, you know, from where you are, and feel free to say a little bit more about who you are and what you're doing, but from where you are and what you've seen, what are the seeds of hopefulness um, for young people following this pandemic. And perhaps if I start with you, Kieran, um, if, with your perspective. Thanks, James. Um, and it's really exciting to be here. Thanks for having me. So I run The Difference. My name's Kieran, and um, I'm really lucky to work with two groups of leaders who have been working um, tirelessly throughout the pandemic. One group um, who work in mainstream schools and are senior leaders. And what they're finding, a sort of seed of hope, if you like, is that historically, some of their most vulnerable learners might have been known to them as senior leaders, but slightly more invisible within the school. Um, so some of the data patterns show us that it's that often children who've had social worker at a time in their life who can be quite vulnerable to some of the challenges like school exclusion. And I know that Jamie's farm welcomes a lot of children who've been excluded from school. Um, so one of the things that they're finding really um, positive about the pandemic is actually they've been allowed to say these are students in our care who we believe are particularly vulnerable and should be coming to school um, despite the pandemic. And that's really, really helped um, all classroom teachers be aware of who those students are and just be more professionally curious about what some of the challenges are that might be um, that, that they might be facing. And then another um, sort of seed of hope, I think, is that we have a much better, uh, all of us, shared understanding of how important social interaction is for our well-being. Uh, I definitely feel that stuck in my house uh, talking over over this platform and I think that empathy is really really important to ground us in um, exactly some of the things that Tish talked about how our mental health suffers when we feel as though we're not with our peers and we're not gaining um, the benefits of that social interaction and that's particularly important when it comes to disrupting the patterns around school exclusion which is what my second group of leaders do. They work in people referral units for two years um, and they are finding um, that actually a lot of their friends are just much better able to empathise with the young people that they work with and they're really excited about the potential for that um, when they go back into mainstream school and try to work upstream and reduce exclusion. Thanks, Kieran. And uh, I'll, I'll reintroduce people when because I, I picked up from the chat that I was maybe a bit speedy on introducing people. But Kieran Gill from The Difference, thank you for that. And we'll we'll come around perhaps next to Rebecca Boomer Clark, who is from um, Arc, and you're you're in charge of secondary schools across the Arc chain. What 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 are you picking up? What are the seeds of hope that you're seeing? Um, hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm just so delighted that so many people are, are tapping into the sort of magic and wisdom of Tish and Jamie and the team at, at Jamie's Farm. Um, so, so I guess three reflections from, from me. Um, I, I'm actually really optimistic. I think we're, we're talking an awful lot, quite understandably, about academic catch up at the moment. Um, but actually, I think we have an opportunity to be um, perhaps more ambitious and imaginative in terms of approaching reset and recovery as an opportunity to really recalibrate expectations um, of, of what schools are, are exist to achieve and what our young cap young people are capable uh, are capable of of, of doing. Um, one of the things that we've definitely noticed, um, and I think it holds real potential for us when, when schools return, um, is that we're starting to tap into um, the, that space of parental engagement much more um, in, with, with a much greater intensity. Um, I think that ironically schools and homes have become much closer together through this period. Um, and so, so looking ahead to how we can continue to support our most vulnerable learners when they return to school, continuing to, to, to focus on how we can how we can maximize and enhance and extend parental engagement seems to be um, a massive untapped untapped opportunity. 
Um, and, and to an extent, I guess, um, we've all had our own vulnerabilities exposed through the pandemic. Um, that, but, but we perhaps we perhaps I know our young people um, better than ever before in some in some respects. And so thinking about how we can, can continue to build upon that in terms of our pastoral care on an ongoing basis is something that we are we're really we're really thinking hard about. Um, but the other thing that I think has become really clear is that schools occupy you know, such an important place in our communities and the fabric of our societies. In this sort of period of the suspension of, of accountability tables and sort of performance metrics, um, I think it's forcing us to think more creatively about, about the purpose of schools and the purpose of education. There can be no doubt that um, academic qualifications are the currency of choice, but they're no, they're, they're no guarantee of success. Um, and, and I think that we have got a moment to really think hard about um, the, uh, the richer and more expansive role of schools. Um, actually, what it is that our young people need to leave their full time education having acquired in terms of the skills and attributes that will enable them to go on to lead purposeful and fulfilling lives. And it seems to me that we have a we have a space now and some time now to think really differently, differently about that. Um, and we should seize the opportunity. Rebecca, thank you. Yeah, the purpose of schools. I mean, it is it is really that question has really been raised by this whole pandemic. We've had virtually no traditional school for a for a year. What what difference uh, has that made? We've completely um, changed the way education is delivered. Um, what do we learn from it? So uh, that's a good question for Bex Kramer to answer in her introduction. So Bex, you're you're leading um uh, founded and leading a school which is really um, embedded in the local community, isn't it, in a, in a unique way. Tell us what your experience has been and what seeds of hope you're seeing. Yeah, thank you so much, James. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to answer Beck's question, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best as we go through the discussion. And I wanted to share kind of three things that we're grappling with as an organisation as we emerge from this, and I completely agree there's so much hope um, on the horizon. Um, the first thing is that we use lockdown one as a period to create real stability for the children who need it at the most. Um, and we've kind of continued that throughout these you know, other lockdowns that we've had. Um, and what we've found is that those children who have been in school have really kind of gained this sense of feeling settled in the space that is school. And I think that's something really interesting to take away and think about. Um, because often school can be big and unsettling, particularly for children that are uh, you know, going through transitions or have complex lives. And what we've seen is the autumn term was extremely calm for our students. And um, the students really felt like they had an identity in the space that I don't think they had before um, this experience. The second thing, um, as a kind of being touched upon, is that this has been an incredibly loving experience. And in Hounslow, um, where our school is, uh, they've had the, the second highest number of people being put on furlough in the country because of all the jobs that he threw in the M4 corridor. And what that has meant is that our parents are really, really struggling and they are dealing with things that are very adult um, and at the same time trying to, in some respects, shield their children from some of the horrors of the pandemic. And what, what we have seen and what we're thinking about a lot is how do we help people who would really have their self-worth question? the best time they lost their job and they're dealing with, with death in their family how do we help those people to maintain dignity and to treat them with kindness through all of these challenges and that has really led to us thinking about all of our interactions as educators and as teachers with parents how do we enable people to retain dignity in interactions at the hardest of times and that's something that that is really making us question the way that we approach everything that we do really um, and then the third Thing I think is, is something that, that everyone is, is, uh, is, is grappling with, and that is that we've had to be really flexible. You know, we've had to change things at a moment's notice. We've had to um, you know, make new plans, rip old plans, go again. And what that has shown us is that there, there are many routes to the end goal. And if for us the end goal is that all of our children live lives of choice and opportunity, um, and, and that's made me think about what are, the, what are the routes? When is it okay to deviate from what? We're doing and when is it necessary to stay on course and so some kind of big questions there that, that we're thinking about. 
Thanks, Bex. And um, I, I can see you were valiantly struggling with the internet gremlins, um, which were causing you to break up a little bit there. But I think we, we, we were able to follow you. Um, and last, but I mean, one of the points that really um, st stuck with me that you made was about the dignity and how we enable um, parents and as well as children to maintain their, their dignity through this, but also around the, the, the incredible flexibility that schools have, have shown. Now, um, I'm going to come on to Jake in a moment, but I just wanted to flag that um, we would love to have questions from the audience for this panel. So please do start pinging. Uh, questions into the questions selection and we'll be able to put them to the panel um, but the um, next person I wanted to ask to just give his perspective is Jake who's deputy CEO at, uh, at Jamie's farm you have as we heard from Tish you've had 8,000 children pass through Jamie's farm over the last few years but the last year must have been a particularly challenging one for Jamie's Farm, and I wonder what you've learned about young people and what hope you have now um, off the back of uh, this pandemic. Thank you, James. Um, it's quite inspiring hearing uh, the three leaders who've just um, who've just been on stage. Uh, I am actually at the farm at the moment, so if there's any background noise, then you can blame the tractor drivers and also the young people downstairs, and we're delighted that we've actually got a group of Oh dear. I think we just, we, I don't know if that was the tractor driver or the young people. Oh, I my back. <laughs> and my back. It was not the young person or the tractor. I think somebody uh, administratively threw me off stage, didn't like what I was saying. Um, <laughs> You're back. So, yeah, so no, I just wanted to say that actually, um, yeah, I mean, I'm incredibly um, hopeful uh, given what the people have just said on stage, to be honest. Um, and actually, just it made me think of this quote that a colleague of mine, Wendy, sent us recently, which is this um, this one I think really strikes a chord to me now. So physicist Amori Lovins was asked whether he was an optimist or a pessimist. And he replied, I am neither because they are just two forms of fatalism. The optimist says things have to get better and the pessimist says things have to get worse. I believe in applied hope. Things can get better, but you have to make them so. And I think that's what this event is all about. I think we can talk about this. And actually, what I'm really excited about is the idea of putting some of this into practice. And I, and I think the thing that particularly I wanted to pull out from what everybody is saying is just how important relationship is. Relationship is everything. And we're going to hear some of that from the young people later. I was lucky enough to, um, to go to a children's home with um, Emmanuel, uh, who we'll hear from later recently. And one of the things that the young people there were just telling me, they were in a beautiful, a brand spanking new home in Gloucester, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, actually, other than the Jamie's Farms, but obviously I'm biased. And we asked them, you know, what is it that makes a difference about this place? Why is it good? And they just said, the staff. The staff give a damn. And the best schools through this pandemic have shown that. And I think what Owen said there about the variance in uh, responses of the kids, I think that's what it came down to. And we've got three leaders who've just been speaking there who are genuinely talking with their whole heart about what could be different um, and all of us involved in this system have to make it so. And, and I think just to pick up a little bit on what Bex was saying there, um, Rebecca Boomer Clark, I think it's just so important to take this opportunity without exams, to actually think hard about what we want our system to be and what young people we want to have coming out of it and how we want to measure that, which obviously really fits through because we're lucky at Jamie's Farm. We don't have to, 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 to um, stick by exam league tables. Uh, we get freedom. We get small groups of young people and we can be flexible around their needs. And, and that's a main reason why they flourish. We respond by coming to them, meeting them, meeting their needs, giving them space and building relationships with them. And crucially, they have a space to thrive, an opportunity to succeed. And whatever we do in this next three months, as kids go back to school, what I'm hoping for is that they'll have an opportunity in something, whatever it is, to succeed. It might be music, it might be sport, it might be drama. With that success, they are much more likely to get engaged with education once again. And actually, some of those kids who are particularly struggling with that beforehand might find something to impassion them that otherwise wasn't there. Thanks, thanks so much, Jake. And I, I think um, what, what you say really does resonate, uh, this, this idea of... Um, 
putting hope into practice, it's no good just talking about uh, hope and optimism. It's, it's got to actually uh, be grounded in practical reality. And uh, um, Rebecca, I, with uh, your sort of view over schools uh, at ARC, what, what is it, what are the sort of practical things that you're thinking about now that will help um, young people, particularly the most vulnerable, grow out of this uh, pandemic rather than be sort of left behind or even crushed by it? I mean, I think the I think the biggest thing that we're saying is don't panic, um, and 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 so we we've been focused on what what should the return to school look like, um, and and for us it's about making sure that we privilege certainty. It's about bringing stability, having strong routines, re-establishing relationships, enabling young people to socialise with one another and to build their confidence back. And, and actually sort of resisting the temptation to jump onto the sort of academic treadmill of, of, of catch up and intervention. That's really important. We know that we need to close the gap and we need to do it for our most disadvantaged young people, even more so than their peers to, to a degree. But actually, we should be patient. Um, we need to build from strong foundations uh, and, and, and have confidence, actually. That, that once we can get our students back in school, settled, focused, with a sense of direction in their lives and, and, and something to aim for and aspire to, that we'll be able to accelerate those, those learning losses. The other thing that we're being really thoughtful about, I think, is thinking about actually being really clear about what gaps we're trying to close. Are we trying to close a curriculum gap? Are we trying to close a learning gap? Is it a provision gap? Is it a forgetting gap? Um, and to be really precise for each individual young person, actually, where their, where their needs are. Um, and the other thing that I think is really exciting um, is the opportunity that, that of, of digital. Um, it's been remarkable. We've achieved things as a profession overnight that actually just 18 months ago, um, none of us would have believed were possible. And I think that that gives us, it, you know, it, it's, it's no substitute for the, for the importance of and the relationship between a teacher and their, and, and their young people. But actually, I think it does give us a chance to approach this, this period of closing gaps quite creatively um, and gives us much more flexibility. So yeah, lots to, lots, to, lots to focus on. But I think the biggest thing is we're looking at how we can maximise this as an opportunity. It's a springboard to ensure that our education system goes on to deliver even more for every child, um, you know, five, ten years from now. I think that the sort of old phrase that it's, we tend to overestimate what we can achieve in one year and underestimate what we can achieve in a decade rings true. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a great point to remind us of. The uh, just building on some of the questions, so I've n I now am seeing lots of great questions coming in. By the way, um, and I, I want to pick up uh, one in particular, which is about ensuring that this sort of catch up agenda does focus not solely on the academic, but also on the social and emotional support that children will, will need. And what can we do to ensure this really does pan out in, in reality? Now, um, Bex Kramer, I'm sure this is what you're thinking about, but you know, your, your schools are under this huge pressure, will be under this huge pressure to uh, ensure hard catch up in exam results. How do you in ensure we don't squeeze out the, the whole child? Oh, I think you might need to unmute, or are you? Yes, you do need to unmute. That's Please better. tell me if my internet cuts out again. Um, sorry about last time. Um, yeah, look, I think it's all of our job, right? It's all of our job to keep this at the top of the agenda. It's necessary for all of us in our roles in schools or, or working with children to keep having this conversation. Um, because it's very easy for this to get lost, as you say, with, with exam results and things like that. Um, I think one of the things that we're really focused on is um, listening and having a conversation without an agenda and really kind of being open to the different experiences that people have had throughout this pandemic. And they've not all been negative. You know, many people have had really valuable experiences, spent more time with families, had more time outdoors than they would have done. Um, and so, you know, we've got this this real kind of balancing act to do to get to the bottom of what it is that 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 needs to happen. Um, and I think that that we need to make sure that we are, you know, as a school, we are making some decisions about when we return, what will we do? And, and to Jake's point earlier, you know, we'll be going for the quick wins. We'll be going for those things that make children feel successful when they're back in school. And those things are probably 
probably not going to be exams as soon as they walk through the door. It's really important that we focus on our child um, and making sure that they feel heard and feel loved for everything that they are and everything that they're bringing back to school before we start to have the conversation about um, curriculum and, and what needs to happen. We need to re we need to get to re know them when they return. Thanks, Bex. And uh, just um, building on that point, because I, I can t totally, I think everybody in the in the chat is sort of recognising the importance of this, but worrying about the, if you like, the national picture. So how can we, um, you, you can you can perhaps, we hope, do that at the child level. How can we ensure it happens at the national level as well? And I wonder, Kieran, you're remarkably successful at influencing um, national um, politicians. How, how would you advise uh, that we manage that at both levels. That's kind, James. Well, one of the things that um, we've been talking about a lot at The Difference is this opportunity of, of having vulnerable students more visible. And just to clarify what I mean by that, at the moment, if you're a frontline teacher, as I was an English teacher, when you have your register, you know who is um, a child who might be living in poverty. They're, they're, they might be with a pupil premium um, sign on the register and Ofsted know who those pupil premium children are uh, and governors do and government does. And government counts in, in, the, in the statistics that Owen was sharing also, you know, who are students from more um, disadvantaged backgrounds economically and what's the gap between their performance and other students? So that's the case for children who might be living in poverty. It's also the case when it comes to children who might have recognised special educational needs. Um, the country knows that it, it is often extra effort that needs to be given by teachers and schools to make sure those children really achieve their potential. So when it comes to living in poverty or having special educational needs, those children are visible. But when it comes to young people who are interacting with social services, perhaps historically and perhaps not having been fully taken into care, but nevertheless suffering some of the challenges that we know have been growing, uh, particularly under lockdown, like experiences of domestic violence or um, substance misuse or perhaps mental health problems in the home, those kinds of safeguarding challenges, those children are often invisible. And one of the things that the difference is really advocating for is actually that we need to make those vulnerable students visible. Um, and in the, in the long run, we'd love to see there being extra resource for exactly those young people, exactly as there is uh, when it comes to children who've been living in poverty or who have special educational needs. And that that should be dedicated so that schools um, who are going the extra mile can um, make sure that they're investing in those young people. and, and also, importantly, using the rigorous data analysis to see where they are closing gaps for young people. So that's a, a kind of big picture, um, hopeful thing. But I should actually say that the, the actually much more immediate thing that's giving me a lot of hope right now is Jake said, we need to put hope into practice. And I've got the privilege of um, this last few years. When I started The Difference, our, our key work is to try and attract amazing teachers to work for two years with children who've been excluded from school and turn that work into previously sort of low status conceived work in teaching to actually raise it up and make it high status. And when I started this, we, we were just looking for 10 teachers. Um, and this year we've had 900 teachers say, I want to, to put hope into practice. I want to dedicate my career and my leadership journey to really having a specialism in well-being and safeguarding and the sort of things that you're talking about on my way to mainstream headship. So 900 teachers have come forward with interest this year, which is really, really hopeful and exciting. That's that's a really interesting point. I'm going to come. Um, I'm going to come onto this. So, sort of how how is this? How's the pandemic reset? Somebody talked about the idea of it being a reset. How does it reset the relationship between parents and schools and teachers, and uh, um, as well as between children and, and teachers? Incidentally, just flagging that there is um, the we'll get the occasional opportunity popping up on the screen, you also have the opportunity to vote on some of the questions that we've been discussing. For example. Um, we've been asking you which group of children are you most worried about during the return to school and I can tell you that 66% of you are worried about disadvantaged children most of all uh, with the next group being year 10 and year 11 which is interesting. Pupils with special educational needs less um, anxiety from this group about which is interesting. I'd, I'd love for you to vote on the um, seeds of hope what um, what do you think is the most important thing there? Uh, we've got a, quite a, a wide split of what that is, but I'll leave you to, to look at the polls. 
Um, I want to come on to this uh, question about the reset. So it certainly feels to me as a parent and many parents that I've spoken to that there is massive new respect for schools and, and, what, and the work the schools do. I mean, it's always been there, but that has you know, really got off the scale now that uh, many parents have uh, had to handle this themselves. And I just wonder, um, you know, what, maybe, maybe uh, Jake, give us your perspective at slightly at an angle on this. How, how do you think um, uh, that, what effect is that change in relationship between parents and schools and parents and pupils going to have? Is it a positive one? Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. Um, and actually, we've experienced it more ourselves because we've had day visits of kids coming each day to us whereas previously we'd have a residential. So the parents are actually seeing the changes on a daily basis as opposed to the weekly basis, which is actually really great. We've made contact with the local community much more. Um, I think that basically, as we know, kind of parents have, have struggled a lot in this period, as you're kind of pointing out, and that respect for teachers is there. But it's because I think also, as I said before, the best schools have reached out to them. And we had Rebecca Kramer talking about that. We had this sense of actually treating them with dignity and actually also thinking hard about, you know, it's the classic sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, looking after their basics before they get onto the higher levels and reaching out to them. And, and I do think that schools really have made themselves, not just schools, alternative provisions and some other kind of um, local authority groups have made themselves real kind of bastions of support in the community for these young people. And I suppose what, what the really important stage is what happens next you know and and again i will talk about reach briefly because obviously the family hub model is is a really powerful idea of this um and particularly um it's just getting a lot of press at the moment because i think people are paying a close attention to it which is amazing and one of the things that we're really excited about is the fact that you know one of the things that we when we go into reach we see done really well is the lunch time where you actually sit around all together around the same table and take time to eat together with a member of staff um, sometimes listening to people who might come in and share a few ideas about different things, but also teaching some basic elements of kindness and thanking each other in that way that is just so important at creating what Tish called the culture of kindness and then giving people a well done with that feedback loop and those basic things. My teacher, um, my own teacher when I was at school, one of the things that stayed with me the most, he said, manners maketh man. That's what he said. He might be listening right now actually because I invited him to join, but there's something in there. And we want young people leaving our schools who, who understand some of that thing, that stuff. And one of the, the times at Jamie's Farm when it is most powerful is round that lunch table when we're discussing what we've achieved before and we're giving each other a well done. And, and I do want to just say there is a false dichotomy that often gets talked about between academic rigour and pastoral support. That doesn't, it's not, the best schools do both. As, as an example of, of school leaders here who have managed both. And actually part of the way they do that is by reaching out to parents and getting them on board because parental engagement is so important in that. But part of it is just about pure relationships and relationships take effort. But when you establish them, then you can do all sorts with them. And, and just building on that point, the, you know, obviously there's been a lot of talk about mental health for children. But Grace in the question, Grace Osborne asks a good question, which is, um, it's not just a challenge for the children, it's a challenge for the adults. And what um, have what have we what have you done to increase to put staff well-being on your agenda so that uh, they're in the best place to support young people? What are the kind of things that that have been done? And uh, perhaps if I start with um, Rebecca and then come to Kieran. Which one? I'll, shall I go? Oh, shall sorry, I, I, I made you giant, so it's you. <laughs> So staff well-being, um, you know, in, in a way, the sort of taking care of taking care of our adults is a mirror of the way that we need to take care of our young people, too. I think that the biggest thing that, that, that we keep reminding ourselves is that um, everybody, although it's been a universal event, everybody has been living through their own personal version and, and experience of lockdown. Um, and, and I think to an extent we can empathise, but actually it, none of us really knows. Um, you know, when, when people are going to find it most challenging or, 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 or most difficult. Um, I think we, we really shouldn't underestimate quite how relentless it has been for teachers to pivot to online learning. I mean, it is exhausting. Um, teaching is exhausting at any time, but, but you come into teaching because you, you get the sense of passion and energy from working with young people day in, day out to give as much 
but to not be able to have that sort of source of source of, of, of energy in front of you is, is really exhausting let it, before you even start to think about the sort of technical skills and so I think I think the way that we're approaching it is to, is to look in parallel really um, and think about it and put as much detail into thinking about what does a day in the life of a teacher look and feel like when we come back to school as much as what does a day in the life of a student look and feel like when, when we come back to school. Um, and I think more than anything else, we need to sort of be kind and patient with it, with one another as we as we reemerge. Great, great thought. And and finally, Kieran. I mean, uh, interestingly, one of the ways in which we look after our teachers is by taking them to Jamie's farm. So um, the difference leaders go away um, and, and are able to reset. And it's where we start to build some of the cultures, borrowing some of the, the cultures that Jamie's farm uses. That check in um, around the dinner table of how people are doing um, is so simple to just get people to start to talk about their um, yeah, their own well-being. Um, and that's really, really valuable alongside a supervision um, process that we now use with psychologists. So like Jamie's Farm, we're trying to think, how do we meld mental health and teaching and, and really use that model? It's a compassionate model um, to help teachers, exactly as Beck says, show that compassion to themselves and to each other so that they're healthy enough to be able to show compassion to students. And, and I really hope that that might take off in, in future years so that just like social workers or particularly mental health workers, have supervision and a place to talk about the difficulties of, of dealing with um, of people who are distressed um, that teachers also get that really important space when they're working with learners who need extra care. Brilliant. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me now because I've slightly um, I've managed to lose the uh, screen somehow. Can if if uh, we can anybody, you can great. That's good news. Um, I can't actually uh, control the screen anymore. But um, I, what I what I just wanted to to do was really to to wrap up by thanking you all for the richness of insights and uh, what you've sh shared with us today has been absolutely fascinating. And um, what I'm hoping to do is. Um, if I can, uh, unfortunately, I can't uh, find my screen to move on, but I just want to say thank you. If, if we could, we'd all applaud you, but unfortunately, in this virtual world, we can't. Um, but I, I did just want to flag that on that last question, um, looks ahead to our next event in a way, because that next one will be about well-being and creating a culture of care, and there will be a link in the chat for people if they like to sign up to that. So just to, just to reference that and... Uh, Finally, thanks to everybody on the panel. It was absolutely fascinating. And look, I've managed to find the screen again. Fantastic. Now, I can, um, do you ever have that where you have sort of multiple screens and you're wondering where, where on earth has it gone? Um, anyway, thank you very much indeed. And I'm going to move on to the next stage um, in this. We're more or less um, on time. The next stage is um, really to hand it over to young people themselves. Um, and I'm really pleased to be able to welcome up to the stage somebody who perhaps has a greater interest in these issues and perhaps a greater responsibility over the question of what we should do about them than anyone else. So Josh McAllister is the founder of Frontline, the uh, uh, organization recruiting great social workers, but uh, he's also the newly appointed chair of the Independent Review of Children's Social Care. And that's going to shape the future of children's care. So we're going to give him now the opportunity to ask questions of a group of young Jamie's farmers and learn more from the horse's mouth about what they themselves think. So I'd like to invite, firstly, Josh onto the stage. Uh, yep, there he is. Excellent. Hi, hi, Hello, Josh. <laughs> Good to see you. To and see you in a moment, well. we're going to invite up um, some young people to th that you can have a chat with. Um, exactly. But I'm here. They, I think maybe they be they'll be coming here. Helia, yeah. chat with them here. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. Hello, Helia. How are you? Oh. Oh. I'm great. Thank you. Excellent. Great, and unmuted. Good to meet um, you. And uh, Jack. Not visible yet, and hopefully Amir. While we're waiting for the, oh, here we go. There's Amir. Amir. How are you, Amir? Hey. And Jack. Before, be, while they're while they're getting um, synced up, Josh, could I just ask you one question? You, this is a huge responsibility that you have um, to to lead this review of children's social care. What is your hope for it? 
We've got every year 750,000 children in England who end up with a social worker in one way or another. And over a six year period, so a school career, if you like, at secondary school, one in 10 of every children um, in a school will end up having a social worker in average. So it's, it's a lot of kids. Um, and it's often one of these services that we don't see a lot of. Um, it, it's a bit more hidden away. But I guess it's so fundamental because the reason, very often the reason why children's social care becomes involved in someone's life is because uh, children don't have those foundations of safety, stability, love, connection, um, that they need to have that successful childhood growing up. And so my hope is that we can build something. And um, when I say we, I quite deliberately use the word we, that this isn't just about national government or local government. It's about all of us, neighbours, extended family, um, friends, everybody stepping up so that we've got a better chance for every child to grow up with that safety, stability and that love. Um, because the impacts for kids not having that uh, or that being more fragile are enormous. And, you know, we've just spent um, the, the, the best part of this afternoon talking about the impact uh, in, in different ways. But it's um, it's so foundational. So my hope is that, you know, this is a review that's not being triggered because uh, a child's died. It's not being triggered because there's a particular crisis although you could describe lots of what's wrong with the system at the moment as in crisis um, it, it's a chance to look at the whole thing you know how do we support families how do we um, make sure children that come into care are given the, the stability and, and, and decent homes and connections and familial connections to go off into adulthood with so it's um it's a huge responsibility as you say and i'm not yet due to start it so this is actually my first, my first thing I'm doing under the guise of the, the review, but I'm still. Well, um, you're very lucky. You're very lucky. That I am. I am. To talk to Jack, who's managed to sort out his link. I see you got a bit of help there, and uh, Helia and Amir. So we'll, we'll just step back and we'll let you have a chat. Um, and I hope you don't mind us just listening in. Yeah, brilliant. And and a huge part of this role, and it's why it's so good to be here with you, Helia, Jack, and Amir, is um, to hear the voices of children, young people, families who have been on the receiving end of social work, um, and to make sure that your views shape the review from the very beginning. So this is the first thing I'm doing as chair, and this is the first conversation I'm having. Um, so it's great, great to be with you. Um, Helia, can I start with you and ask, um, you know, very often, we talk about the power of relationships in this work. And I think the word can be used so often that adults lose sight of what it actually means. For you, what are the qualities that adults show when they're doing this work relationally really well? Um, just let me know if I understand the question. Uh, you mean, what's the most important thing between a professional and a young person, in my opinion? Exactly. So to build that trust, what, what, what are the qualities that matter most? So you said it yourself. Um, the most important factor, the base factor is trust. So trying to build the net, building that up is by being honest with the young person as well as being realistic. Because a lot of times professionals forget their... Um, limitations or what they can actually offer and they might promise you um, something for example this this assignment will be done by the end of the week but the reality is it won't be because you have other young people that you need to support and you don't know what type of emergencies might come up so for me it's actually being honest with a young person and having genuine conversations and saying um, when do you, for example, need that assignment for? And if the young person said tomorrow, then it's an emergency. But if it's within a month, maybe you can, you know, delay that for another two weeks and let the young person know, listen, like I have other young people that I need to support. If this can wait and if yeah. you can understand where I'm coming from, because a lot of times we try to help young people a lot of time we're trying to offer to do our best but the reality is time limitation the reality is the case load of work that you have so yeah. having genuine conversations and being honest of what you can offer and what you can do is the most important one 
and as well as being realistic. Um, and us young people, especially uh, vulnerable, considered as vulnerable young people, we need a special um, looking after plans. So um, being honest can play a big fact of trying to build trust with that young person because that young person hasn't had that trust relationship maybe in the past or with the family or yeah. even with schools or teachers. So, and Jamie's farm had played that factor as well <laughs> a lot by being having honest conversations, having genuine conversation on what they can offer. So, yeah, thank you. So no you want you want people to commit and deliver and 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 do what say, say what they can actually say what they can actually do. Thank you. Um, Jack, over to you. We've not met before, but I've heard you're a very confident young man. Uh, is what, what I've been told by Jake, and um, I know that you credit your Jamie's Farm experience quite a bit with how you've developed yourself um, to the extent now that you're actually working as part of the, the farm team um, and are working with other children. So can you share a little bit with us what it was about that experience at the farm that was so important for your journey? Um, well, thank you for the compliment to start off with. And I've also heard from Jake that you're fantastic as well. Um, so it's brilliant. Um, Mutual admiration. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it, for me, um, obviously it starts with family. Um, for a lot of people that come to the farm, they don't understand what a family is because they never got that opportunity to understand family. Um, they don't get to necessarily build close relationships. They don't get to um, um, understand what it is when you're being told, don't do this, don't do that. And please do this, please do that. And the reasonings behind it there's we're trying to be as fair as we possibly can at jamie's farm um and and with that why i personally valued most or maybe it's two maybe it's two um reflection every every day we're doing simple reflections how we're feeling rate it out of 10 it's very very basic stuff and a lot of people who know about jamie's farm that's the number one thing they hear about the reason why that's the number one thing they hear about is because it's so important to forget about what's going on in this world and just think me as an individual um i'm feeling it's been a long day i'm probably feeling a three out of ten a lot of things have been going wrong and i'm getting annoyed with this and i'm, I'm messing up in this area now i know that now I know that I've messed up in that area. Now that I, I know um, I was being a bit mean to that person or just simple little reflections. You don't always notice everything you're doing, but now you know that and now you can carry on into your next steps in life and think, oh, yeah, I do. I do get a bit angry with my, um, at someone at Jamie's farm or someone at school simply. And maybe I need to just maybe tone that down a bit because that makes me feel a bit upset. Um, so those simple reflections and then with that, the... The shout outs, I, um, and that's what we do in each meeting. The check, we do a check in, go around the table, have this feeling and then a shout out or a shout, a shout out is when uh, we, on the farm, we see an, an individual who's doing really well and we want to go, uh, Josh, you've been amazing. I've, I've, I'm so impressed with how great you were at cleaning out the pigs. You really got in it, how gross it was, but you didn't care. That was amazing. And before you get to that moment and you're counting down and you see that it's about to be your turn to speak a bit like this, to be honest, you, you get that little bit of nerves, a little bit of excitement. And then once you've done that, once you've given that compliment and that person who receives the compliment is like, oh, oh my, I'm doing really well. I'm doing things right. This is amazing. Feeling great. And then once the, the person who said that is like, oh, all the stress is let out. You're feeling, I feel so relaxed after every um, shout out. And then little relationship is built there from that simple compliment and if everybody's giving a compliment um in a meeting that's a lot of lovely things to say about people um and then that creates that further family dynamic where uh, and i'm kind of cheating here because i do work on the farm i've just been off doing a session i probably still have a bit i think i have a bit of mud there on my face from a session um so, uh, sorry we've got someone coming in uh 
Let, wait a sec. Lester, don't right. come, please. Lester, Lester, I'm doing it. Lester, no. Sorry. It's a live in action <laughs> moment with Jack. Live in action. We're living it. We're living it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, what, could, you, could you just tell me what no, look, I think, the last second? Yeah, no, you, you, uh, uh, we, we definitely got that. Um, and I uh, think that you described creating those, those almost those small moments, building the relationship up, is um, mm. is really powerful. Be because you, Jack, because you've been both at Jamie's Farm as a young person and also work there now. You've been on, if you, if you like, both, both sides of the stable door. What is it you think that professionals? most often get wrong when they're working with young people in this space so they're sort of themes or patterns that you've noticed well um it's very easy to just go and complain and say oh they do all these things wrong we do a lot of a lot of things are going to being done right and that's great and that's fantastic but for me what i've noticed um is especially from this week um you you kind of want to be this loving caring dictator that controls the whole situation and you make sure that everything is going well and that they have got their Wellington boots on at this time and they're it's all so precise and they don't get any chance to fail because you've catched them before they get that chance to fail and yeah that that can be seen as some level of kindness and and that and to some degree depending on what the failure is if the failure is being run over by a tractor definitely get in the way and save that but if it's a simple one like you haven't necessarily done something correct with your overalls so the overalls are going to get muddy I'm, I might I might not always say about that sometimes I will and sometimes they won't listen and then I'll go okay you didn't listen you're going to learn from that you go and yeah. we go into the session we get muddy and they learn and they and I learned my most of my thing most of my great ideas in my opinion from all my terrible failures um, yeah. and that's what and then that child who did do the who mess up their overalls today boom wrapped them up ready suit and boot because they managed to have that level of failure and then understand oh what oh, okay i'll i'll change this and then then it all works out yeah so Brilliant. yeah that, that, failing well so just simple things just giving people opportunity to be themselves being free like sometimes i i know i know one time i came to farm i get to come to the farm quite a lot and i was really lucky for that and I know I probably was a bit annoying or a bit mean or and I, I, I'm not proud about that, but I wasn't necessarily crushed and told you're a terrible person because you're a bit mean. Yeah, you, I, you got to be yourself. You're probably being mean because you're feeling a bit um, a bit sad, a bit alone and then you're attacking other people because of your upset. We, we understand that at Jamie's Farm and we're trying to let them understand that for themselves yeah. and let them fail and let them make the mistakes and then they can make the right decisions later on and we're trying to support them the whole time we're trying to control the situation safely but not being these controlling yeah. dictators yeah brilliant thank you that's that's really clear a uh, great answer um amir over to you. you i think you've heard a bit about what my job is um going to be in the next uh, year or so and um, if you had a blank piece of paper and we were starting again with the whole of children's social care what would you what would you do what would you start to, to write on it um i would just i would just write in a big big words as, as a title that every kid is different and it's not just about writing it down it's just making sure that kid knows that the kid just doesn't feel like oh i'm just another kid in the system there's going to be a decision made on. the reason i'm saying as a title because whenever you write that as a title every time you're going to make a decision you're going to be like oh i need to think about that before we're in the actions we will think about that again mm -hmm. and also giving giving like kids more opportunities especially teenage years because you're just trying to find yourself you're just trying to find out what you want to do and a lot of times you don't get as much opportunities as other kids probably and sometimes even though like you might find out like oh like this person knows that they have, like they know what they want to do they don't need like some try something different giving them that chance to try something different might just confirm that oh i'm, I'm really good at this or might you might just bring up oh i'm really passionate about something else like especially for myself i found out uh 
finding that passion, finding just something to do, made everything else that, that was happening around me in my teenage life so much easier because it got, just got me focused on what, what I wanted to do. And yeah, that's, that's what I would want to focus on, just giving yeah, them that they're, they're, they're big things, and, and if I was going to start anywhere, they'd be great. They'd be great places to start. Um, Amir, would you mind sharing with people? You know, this is a not su such an intimate forum, but I'm, I know that you're you're comfortable to share some of your experiences with us of um, living as a teenager in semi-independent living. Um, and if there's anything from that experience that it's important for me to to know about when when I'm doing the review. Um. So the semi-independent I was in, I could just say it wasn't the best and it was kind of a mixed bag. So before you just say anything, just consider that. Um, it was, the staff were nice, some of them were nicer, uh, but I always struggled to have that sort of, build that sort of relationships with the staff. I would have like some sort of key workers for like in daytime, like up to six o'clock. And it was always a struggle to, have the like relationship I, and I think I had a relationship like some sort of friendship with the security guard one of the, one of the security guards which was quite nice we were just all, always talking about football that's all you do <laughs> um, it's quite nice but uh, some, it, I always try to just go there for, to sleep I just try to say my mates say at school just try my best just not to get there, and not, at the time that it felt like a, I would say a prison cell that I would have to go in at night, just make sure I get there. Um, something was surprising for me, it was a accommodation for all males, but we did not have one key worker who was a male, so that was surprising for me. And also we interacted with a lot, like the security guys a lot which sometimes some of the security guards you would think they need some sort of training to deal with younger people who are more vulnerable and i think that that's about all the experience yes. yeah, yeah thank you I made, friends, well, no, go on. I made good friends but i don't think i would go back to that place for another two yeah. years yeah it's, it's an area where we need to do we need to do a lot better for people so um your your experience is not is not alone, um, unfortunately. Helia, can I go back to you and just ask you to wrap up for us um, this particular session? Because I know you're volunteering with your local council, and you've had a chance, I think, to ask a few of the looks after children who are in that uh, area and um, what they think should be changed about the system. So, can you give us uh, sort of rapid fire ideas that, that they came up with? Yeah, first, before I start the answer the question, I just want to thank Amir and Jack for their beautiful answers. Um, and me and Amir, we always do volunteering um, at Healing Link Council. And um, we have different groups of ages. So between 7 to 11, they want uh, their first foster carer to be the right one because um, they get attached to the foster care quite quickly. So if they have to change, that's heartbreaking for them. Um, less of social workers, because uh, we had cases that the, so the young person had 11 social workers to have, which is, a, is an entire football team. Um, be more fun. So if um, you're having a meeting with a young person you need to make expression you need to smell good you need to be entertaining don't be boring and ask repeated questions and actually read the cases of the young people before you meet them uh, then it goes between 11 to 16 ish uh, so they are saying that they don't want to repeat themselves in the meetings is quite frustrating for them to be having to have the same conversations and not getting enough results uh, and being more aware of their entitlements of what they um, actually are eligible for um, which is part of their pathway plan um, and when you come to be a bit more adult, so which we really, you know, are considered as a care leader, uh, to have more accessibility to better housing, because that's that is the biggest problem um, for people like myself. <laughs> so, 
and um, as well as being more prepared for independent living. So, for example, I thought I was prepared and uh, to go and be independent and be an independent woman, but <laughs> the reality is, um, you need to be more prepared you need to have people around you that can support you and say it's okay if what you chose didn't go the way you wanted let's choose this one to actually have support for independent living and not especially in this time of um, covid time pandemic um, not being lonely and feeling lonely so actually having the support um, from professionals it doesn't necessarily needs to be a social worker or a, a care lever. Um, care lever is a personal advisor. It can actually be a teacher that you worked with, um, Jamie's Farms staff members, or uh, from a virtual school, from your education, from anywhere that you can actually relay on, you actually yeah. can have a conversation with. Yeah. yeah, brilliant. Wow, thank you. Well, I think I could probably skip the next 13 months now and, and I was say, yeah thank you so I mean, much how much um wisdom could we could we condense into 20 minutes i think you've got you've got most of what you need there i I'm, can i just say a huge thank you to jack who's i think had to drop off somebody's probably interrupted his internet and to amir and helia um, we can't applaud you because we're online we would if we could but the i don't know if you can read the comments in the in the in the chat channel but uh, people have been applauding you um digitally and um describing you as legends uh, so i i just have to say thank you so much for your time and josh thank you for letting us listen into your not entirely private conversation but um i'm i'm hoping that you'll agree to come back um at a, to a future jamie's farm event and uh, keep us updated on how your review is going Excellent, thank you. Well, now we're, we're going to, uh, we've got a few minutes left um, and I just want to look forward a bit. Um, we're going to be joined by uh, a very special person, Emmanuel Akban Inwang, who is the founder and director of the Lighthouse Children's Home. So uh, Emmanuel himself grew up um, in care, but is now founding an organization, a home, the which is gonna shape the future of children's homes through a new model that he's developed. Now I'm hoping that if he's in the audience, he'll be able to join and just give us a glimpse of the future because we'll be hearing more from Emmanuel at the next uh, Digging Deep event, which as I mentioned earlier, is about cultivating a culture of care. Emmanuel, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Great to see you too. Um, so just to give you a bit of uh, an overview um, of Lighthouse, Lighthouse is an organisation that's committed to improving outcomes for looked after children and particularly those who grow up in children's homes. Now, uh, to set the context, there's about 75,000 children who grow up in care in the UK, about 8,500 of those live in some form of children's home, usually because they can't be in foster care for one reason or another, so they live with um, professionals. Unfortunately, children's homes in the UK aren't what they could be. Some major challenges with them. Uh, for example, we don't tend to recruit the people that we need to, to work in them, often because salaries are low, uh, the work is very challenging, training's not very good, uh, so turnover tends to be high. So in London, we see turnover rates of anywhere between 50% and 80% uh, every year. Uh, also, ch children's homes aren't necessarily in the places that we need them to be. Um, about 16% of um, children who need children's homes are from London, but London only has about 6% uh, uh, of the homes. They tend to be um, t um, uh, they tend to be focused in parts of the country uh, where property is cheap as opposed to where uh, need is high. Um, there's also a real lack of purpose around children's homes. We would expect them to be therapeutic environments where children receive support with their education. Uh, unfortunately, we don't always see that. Uh, and also, they're not necessarily informed by the best um, evidence and the best models uh, available. So what we've done at Lighthouse over the last few years is we've been investigating children's homes in the UK. I spent a lot of time volunteering in them. Um, we've also been to Germany and Denmark, uh, and also Finland to a, a certain degree as well, where outcomes for children are much better. We try to understand why they're so much better. And um, by taking all of that knowledge and research from the UK and combining it with what we've learned in Germany and Denmark, we've come up with a new model for children's home, which we call the Lighthouse model. Um, we like to um, describe it as having four Ps, people, place, purpose and pedagogy. Um, starting with people, um, we believe that this is the, the main pillar um, of, the, of the four Ps and that it's really important for us to be able to go out uh, and find the very best people to work with children and to identify, identify people who have the potential to form really strong lasting relationships um, with young people. And we just heard from Helia a moment ago about the important 
the importance of relationships and also the importance of trust. And when we've spoken to young people about what they want from their residential care workers, they've said exactly the same thing. Um, so that's what Lighthouse is going to be doing. We're actually about to start recruiting um, for our first uh, cohort. So if you're interested in that, you'll be able to join the uh, next event and find out more. And we also believe quite strongly in the concept of place. And children's homes are too often quite institutional. So we've been very careful to make sure that our homes reflect uh, a family environment. Um, and we heard from Jack a moment ago about the importance of family. So a lot of the way in which we've designed uh, the work that we do in our homes is to really uh, reflect the sorts of things that you'd expect in a typical environment, um, family environment. So things like eating a meal together and checking in with each other at the end of the day. Um, we have a really strong purpose around our children's homes and that's built around therapeutic support and also education because we heard, a bit, we heard earlier about the importance of education and supporting children uh, with their education. And we use a method of practice called um, social pedagogy. And social pedagogy has been a really interesting journey for us because we were initially quite heavily influenced by the work at Jamie's Farm and I spent a lot of time there in the early years and um, doing the research for uh, Lighthouse and recognised how important lots, lots of what was done at the farm was going to be for uh, children in care. And then I went off to Germany and Denmark and came across this method of practice called social pedagogy and it reminded me uh, a lot of what was taking place uh, at the farm and it just provides um, a broad framework for the sorts of things that Jamie's Farm um, is already doing. You can find out a, a bit more uh, uh, about that on our website. Um, so just to say uh, a few quick things, we're really excited about the partnership that we've developed with Jamie's Farm. We've learned a huge amount from them. Uh, Jake, the Jamie's Farm Deputy CEO, is also the chair uh, with our advisory board and we've really appreciated all the input and support um, from the farm over the last few years. Um, we're also going to be opening our first children's home towards the end of this year uh, in the autumn and it will be the uh, first realisation um, uh, of all of the research that we've done. Um, beyond setting up children's homes, we also do a great deal of research into residential care. And um, so we're also going to be feeding into the care review that Josh um, is, is going to be chairing and we're really excited to be um, working with him uh, around that. So thank you very much. Emmanuel, thank you so much. And thanks for joining us on stage. And um, thank you to everybody for listening. We've, we, we're coming to the end of our session now, but we have um, one more um, gem to share with you. Um, you heard a bit uh, at the beginning from Tish uh, and about her book and I thought to help us sort of wrap uh, this session up it would be good to come back to Tish and I'd like to invite her up to really just share her final reflections on this afternoon's discussion and issues. Tish, um, you've been described as, 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 as full of wisdom. I'd love to hear your wisdom uh, reflecting back on what you've heard this afternoon. Well, that's the bit all order, but I've just loved hearing everybody who's contributed. And I found it so inspiring because I think during the pandemic, we can, the isolation can mean that we're, we're all sort of working in these individual cells. And actually what I realized today, listening all the different people that, actually there is what Bex talked about optimism the ambitiousness of the projects that we've got to go into now and to be imaginative and last night when Anne Longfield gave her final speech as the um, children's commissioner she there were no holes barred and it, there was she was quite right to say we have to invest in this generation they are our future and we haven't invested enough because we know that all of the things that correlate to children failing in whatever terms you like to define that it are connected to lack of opportunity and to poverty i loved hearing our young people that have been through the farms it was lovely seeing you guys again if you're still logged on and actually um hearing the things that we have really known to be central to everything that trust and that sense of acceptance and acknowledgement of who you are but also that people become reliable and that they become honest um that was really great to hear from helio and from jack knowing that we need to have that sense of belonging and i think there's been a lot of research gone on about what helps people thrive and interestingly they've come up with this sense that it is about having a sense of connectedness that we need to belong and that we need that sense of um we need to feel that we have got a stretch in our lives that we have that creativity and what i would say is in all the things i've heard today um there's a kind of a b c d comes out for me i was trying because i'm not very good at memorizing things it's a way that i can try and boot myself up for the future think 
well, what can we take from what we've shared, from what we know, from what we've learned? I think the first thing is, the A for me is about when children get back, we need to ex acknowledge their individuality that was mentioned just now, yeah. that every child is different. And we're going to get children coming into schools with very different stories and experiences, but they need to have an empathic and welcoming place where they begin to build that trust, share that. And that individuality is came out also in our earlier speakers talking about we need to redefine what is what we're aiming for, what success might look like, because it might be about various forms of enrichment that allow children to have a set of social skills and confidence. If they don't have the natural academic um, abilities, it doesn't mean that they're not going to be people who thrive and flourish in life. Um, I think the B for me is that sense of belonging. And I love the way that both Rebecca's talked in their schools about the schools becoming more community based and bringing in family um, because if the children feel their families have no place in the school and as a parent you you never you very seldom go beyond the threshold when you drop your child off at secondary school or they get there themselves i think that sense of building a community belonging and being involved i think we need to have a way of giving children some control um, they need to feel that they are challenged we know that for instance, teenage brain is needs risk for learning. But most of the research that's been done shows that the one thing that makes a difference in outcome is resilience. And we can't build resilience unless we, we give children those opportunities. And the D for me is this is all depends on the teachers and the people in the schools, the things we're talking about. And we need to support them. We know that a happy child often has a happy parent. We know that a happy class has a, a happy teacher, but that's not gonna happen automatically. And as Beck said, a lot of teachers are really exhausted and I want us to invest in supporting them. Jamie's Farm is really up for sharing our methodology. And the next generation of teachers are trying to help them understand children's behavior so that we get less exclusions and we get less of things that Kieran talked about with children falling off the edge and then all the very sad outcomes. But thank you, everyone. Thank you, James. It's absolutely nerve wracking watching you do this. I was so glad I wasn't you. <laughs> and I really hope people will sign up for the future because it's, it's a great way to share information and ideas. And we're learning all while and we've been kind of reprimed in a way by this event so thank you tish thank you so much for wrapping it up so brilliantly and and, and just to add to what you said thank you to everybody who took part most of all to the young people who contributed their insights but also thank you to everybody who joined i noticed that nearly uh, well more than 170 of you have stayed with us till the very end which is a, a good sign that you've been finding this useful and interesting and um, please do share any feedback with uh, jamie's farm and uh, that's it for this afternoon but we will be digging deep uh, next month on march the 11th at 4 p.m and you can find the registration link uh, in the chat um i'm looking forward to sharing the next one it says in my notes <laughs> <laughs> but I've certainly enjoyed it immensely this afternoon and uh, I'm very grateful to everybody who contributed. I've learned a lot. I hope you have. And I'd just like to say a final thank you particularly to Jake from Jamie's Farm and Jill who have helped organise and behind the scenes are making it all happen. Uh, thank you so much and do join us again next time.